you'll turn with me to the third chapter of Philippians as we look at that together. And certainly the, the background of what has just been presented is the heartbeat here of the Apostle Paul, centering around his relationship with Jesus Christ. I believe the two key statements in this passage, we're going to try to get that definitive, would be verse 8. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them to be but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And then this, this heartbeat that comes out in verse 10 this passion, this almost a prayer here by Paul, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And this is the, the very essence of missions, home and abroad, is this relationship with Christ. I've been reading a book by the name, by, entitled Friendship Factor by Ellen Loy, McGinnis, giving some delineations, some guidelines as far as personal relationships are concerned. He said, first of all, assign top priority to your relationships as we think about friendships. Why do we seldom relate at such a deep level? Why is there such a shortage of friendship? One simple reason, we do not devote ourselves sufficiently to it. If our relationships are the most valuable commodity, we can own in this world, one would expect that everyone everywhere would assign friendship the highest priority. But for many, it does not even figure in their list of goals. They apparently assume that love will just happen. But of course, few of the valuable things in life just happen. When they happen, it is because we recognize their importance and devote ourselves to them. He goes on to say it is simply a matter of priorities. Significant relationships come to those who assign them enough importance to cultivate them. So rule number one is assign top priority to your relationships. And we can identify with that on the, on the horizontal level, on the human level. I trust more and more in our Christian experience. And yet this has a vertical implication to it too. And that is we must assign top priority in developing our friendship, our relationship with Jesus Christ, first and foremost. And then also concerning uh, developing relationships, the second rule he gives is cultivate transparency. And there's a couple of factors that mitigate against this, and one is simply the culture in which we live. That being uh, the James Bond type is the cool thing. This person who is tough and uh, self-sufficient this person who is emotionally inexpressive and detached from personal involvement. And it dictates against developing deep personal relationships, just this culture image that we have of the James Bond type. Also, just the fear of rejection. Self-disclosure, however, brings just the opposite effect. Someone, is, as, as McGinnis puts here, he says, uh, and a curious kind of chemistry begins to work because we have told one another our deepest secrets as we are transparent and we tell this friend our deepest secrets, we begin to understand ourselves better. And again, in our relationship with Jesus Christ, not only must we assign top priority to developing this friendship, but we must be transparent. We must be willing to disclose our de deepest secrets to him, and as we do so, we find not only the effect of a deepening relationship, but we find a knowledge and understanding of ourselves uh, in a way that we never understood ourselves before. And then the third factor he gives here is to dare to talk about your affection. He goes on to say, for fear of seeming sentimental, many of us hold back expressions of warmth and thereby miss out on rich and profound friendships. That's true on the human level. We're afraid to say, I love you. We're afraid to say, you mean so much to me, on the human level. 
And certainly, as we begin to learn to cultivate this in our relationship with Christ, as we begin to express the fact that we indeed love him, we dare to talk about our affection to him, this friendship develops. Fourth, one has learned the gestures of love, and this includes things like giving gifts and uh, where kindliness becomes a habit and so on. True on the human level and true certainly on the divine level. The last one he gives is create space in your relationships. Freedom must be allowed in those friendships where a person is not dominating or manipulating. And Jesus Christ gives us that freedom. He gives us that unmanipulative type of relationship as we relate to him vertically as well. So with this in, in mind, this passage permeates the great passion the great experience of the apostle as he has come to know Jesus Christ personally and intimately as his Lord supremely, as his master, as his savior, but also as his friend. And we'll look just very quickly at these first few verses and then come back uh, to verses 8 and 10 especially. But he starts off here, he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me and it is a safeguard to you. This is a command. It's not a suggestion to rejoice in the Lord. It's a command. And this command is repeated uh, again and again in this epistle. And what we need to do, if we're going to develop as we ought, is to get our focus upon Jesus Christ and rejoice in Him in spite of what the circumstances are around us. So basic. And he says, now look, it's not any trouble to me to repeat this. And it's a safeguard to you. Learn to cultivate rejoicing, adoring, magnifying the Lord in our lives. And then he says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. This, the dogs in those days were not these nice little household pets. They were stray, ravenous dogs. And the picture here is the beware of the person that comes in with the negative, the divisive, the critical spirit. It'll kill your relationship with one another, as well as even with Jesus Christ. Beware of these dogs. Beware of these evil workers. You'll never miss a chance at stirring up negativism and trouble. And particularly beware, specifically I should say, of the false circumcision. These are the Judaizers, the ones who were very, very faithful, it would seem, to the truth, and yet through their legalism, denied the truth by adding to it. And then he goes on to say, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God. Now they majored on, these false circumcisers, the Judaizers, majored on outward performance, on certain observances that uh, the emphasis was on the outside, the external. And no matter what the outward observance is, if it doesn't have the inner reality, then it becomes insignificant. It actually becomes contrary, contradictory to grace, God's operation in our lives. I think to take that a little bit out of the setting of what we find it here, this, of course, was the Judaizers who wanted to circumcise these Christian converts and then to put put the, the believers under the law of Moses to put them again under law rather than grace. But we have a tendency here ourselves and that is we are enamored sometimes without, with our outward performances, with our particular methods. And those methods or those performances have no value unless there is the inner reality there. And what a beautiful thing it is to have a unity in diversity. Now, there's some ministries that are going on in this church or through this church that that are really what we might call real loosey-goosey, you know? And some people say, well, wow, that just doesn't minister to me at all. But it is ministering to some people very, very beautifully. Others are over here with some very high structure, and that's fine. And as long as the inner reality is there, as long as we're worshiping God in the Spirit and not trusting in our or emphasizing our particular methods or our particular 
line of thinking or our particular structure, but the thing is coming from the inside. We're worshiping God in the spirit, and we're glorying not in our service or our methods or our performance or even our orthodoxy, our fidelity to the truth primarily, but we're glorying in a person as we have here. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God. And that has all kinds of expressions, all kinds of forms. And that's the key, that we're in living union, in contact with the living Christ, and we're glorying in him as we respond to him and as we serve him. And put no confidence in the flesh, we're told in, at the end of verse 3. The flesh, that's, that's man in the raw. That's man depending upon his abilities, his willpower, and so on. What man can do, reliant upon himself, really basically independent of God. And Paul is saying, no, we're the true circumcision who worship in living union with the Spirit of God and our glorying in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in what we can produce, relying upon ourselves, operating basically independently of God, but somehow trying to please him in the process. That's putting confidence in the flesh is when we do that. And he gives a little list here of the things that he did before his conversion. And uh, he said, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And he lists, kind of, this is a kind of a balance sheet here, and he's got the assets over here. And he says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, he was a member of the true religion, and he was, he was right there in the center of that. As to the law of Pharisee, he was a religious leader in the most orthodox of the sects of Judaism. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church, that group that was supposedly against the truth. And then as to the righteousness which was in the law found blameless. That was from his viewpoint and from the viewpoint of his culture. And then he says in verse 7, but whatever things were gained to me, all those things I had over there on the asset side of the ledger, I now put over in the liability side of the ledger. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Now let's get the picture here. Paul poured his whole life into what's described here in verses 5 and 6. He literally devoted his heart, his mind, his thoughts, his attention, his whole energy into this career of his, a religious career, and that was to gain acceptability with God. And this was his source of satisfaction, his source of achievement, his source of self-worth, and he was a success as far as his culture was concerned. This guy was a big success, and he was being ministered to a great deal in terms of achievement, satisfaction, and self-worth as he was involved with what he's listed here in verses 5 and 6. And you and I, for our time, ourselves, our time and our thought and our energy, our very beings into certain things. And we get an, uh, a feeling of achievement and satisfaction and self-worth, and we consider ourselves and other people consider our, us as successes as we pour our life into this. And yet he's saying, whatever was gained to me, I've counted as loss for something far more valuable and this that is giving me all these kicks, so to speak. It's for the sake of Christ. And he gave up something along with that. Not only the status symbols of success and that good reputation that he had in his culture. All of us want that, don't we? We want to be accepted. We want to be approved. We want to be appreciated. We want to be loved. He had that. But he gave it up. He gave up that good reputation. He gave up the status symbols of success. He gave up physical comfort to a very ex 
heavy extent, and he gave up financial security. And those are the basic things of life from the human viewpoint. Physical comfort, financial security, good reputation, and the status symbols of success. He said, whatever things were gained to me, those were the things that were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of something infinitely better, for the sake of Christ. And he goes on, and he gets carried away here at verse 8. He says, more than that, I count all things. If I didn't include everything in the previous statements here now, I'm going to, I'm going to encompass everything now. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of what? Of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He had indeed assigned top priority in this relationship. He had become increasingly transparent. He had learned how and dared to talk about his affection to this person, learned the gestures of love increasingly, and created space in his relationships, in his relationship with Jesus Christ. He had developed a friendship. And so he's saying all these things that are so important to us humanly, and there's nothing wrong with them necessarily in themselves, but when it comes to a choice, when it comes to some kind of a one or the other, He's saying all these things, yea, doubtless I count all things as loss in view of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. That relationship with Jesus Christ was the top priority. Dr. Harry Ironside writes this, he was not simp simply exchanging one religion for another. It was not one system of rites and ceremonies giving place to a superior system, or one set of doctrines, rules, and regulations making way for a better one. He had come in contact with a divine person, the once crucified but now glorified Christ of God. He had been won by that person forever, and for his sake he counted all else but loss. Christ and Christ alone meets every need of the soul. His work has satisfied God, and it satisfies the one who trusts him. Along with it, he, we see in verse 9, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God, which is on the basis of faith. He had a perfect righteousness. He had a perfect acceptance now not by law works, not by self-effort, but by faith in Jesus Christ and having the righteousness of God which comes on the basis of faith and faith alone. Total acceptance. And that had permeated, that had sunk into his being to the point where he it was real in his experience, that he was really accepted by God. And then we see in verse 10 this great goal, this great aim, this great purpose, this great passion of the apostles. And of course, the, humanly, the great passion is to, for man is to achieve happiness and comfort, satisfaction, but his great goal is something else. And we see that I may know him. He already knew him, but he's really what he's saying here is that I may know him more deeply and more intimately. And this is the essence of life, is knowing more deeply and intimately in the realm of our experience, Jesus Christ. He is the one inexhaustible person. And Paul is saying here that this is the great passion of my life. I believe that he was even praying at points. This was a great prayer of his heart. O oh Lord, that I may know you more deeply and intimately. This is his goal in life. And of course, this is not achieved by casual contact. It is, it's achieved even as we achieve deep, intimate, personal relationships on the human level. It's achieved by going through deep experiences together, by sharing our lives together. And so Paul, here, somewhat toward the end of his life, his great passion, 
again, though, is that I may know you, Lord, more deeply and intimately in the realm of my experience. And then he is not satisfied with that alone, but that he, he says that I may know the power of your resurrection. And of course, as we relate to Christ in such a way, we, we begin to experience the power of his resurrection. These things are interrelated as he, as he gives this. And again, I think we can conceive of this as we think of ourselves, even praying, Lord, that I may know you more deeply and intimately, and that I may know the power of your resurrection. Paul had prayed for the Ephesian believers. He said that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is, and that you may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, which he wrought when he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. That same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and caused him to ascend and now be seated as supreme Lord of this universe, that same power is available to you and me. Remember when Mary was approached by the angel and was it was announced to her that she would bear the Christ child, and she said, how can this be since I'm not even married? And the answer that was given to her is, Nothing will be impossible for God. Nothing will be impossible for God. Now, I wonder right now if we could just, for a second, close our eyes and think of some of the situations that we have that are confronting us that seem to be impossible, that seem to be totally out of the range of our being able to cope with them. Just closing our eyes and thinking of that son or daughter of ours, perhaps. Some of you are going through some real heartache as your son or as your daughter is in a position, a place far from God and far from even stability in their lives and letting God handle that particular situation. Or maybe you, your job situation, increasingly you're feeling hopeless about it. With God, nothing shall be impossible. Or you think of that enslaving habit that has defeated you for years, that you've had no victory over. Put it in the hands of God. Let him do the impossible, the power of his resurrection. Or we think of the person who has been divorced and how hard it is for you to live trying to raise a family by yourself and all of the obstacles and all of the hardships that are involved with that. Or we think of that strained personal relationship that has gone on maybe for years. Whatever it is, Lord, I can't handle that. It's impossible. I'm in over my head. And we've got to refuse to do anything else but believe God and let him handle the situation, to turn it over to him. Lord, I cannot handle it. And if I try to handle it, I'm going to make a mess of it. Lord, you take it. I'm placing it in your hands. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus when they, the fact of the resurrection was all around them, beating them over the head, shouting, screaming at them with all the evidence they were avalanched with? He said, oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. And how he needs to say to us over and over again, oh, foolish men and women, and slow of heart to believe all that I've spoken to you, that he can do the impossible. Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Chuck Swindoll said this, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. But let's not miss the last part of this. You think, well, if I really pray that prayer, O oh Lord, that I may know you more deeply and intimately, and that I may know more deeply and intimately in the realm of my experience the power of your resurrection, all of a sudden, the Lord is going to say to us, Ah, bless you, my son. Ah, immediately your request is granted, and everything is going to be a big bowl of cherries from now on. How naive we are. 
You know, when we begin to pray a prayer like that, what happens? The rug goes out from underneath our lives. It's a dangerous prayer to pray. It's a dangerous thing to have that kind of a passion because the pathway, okay, instead of God dropping a halo on us, the first half of verse 10, he pulls the rug out from underneath us. The pathway to knowing him more deeply and more intimately, the pathway to knowing more deeply and intimately the power of his resurrection is the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death. When Christ takes control of our lives, there is opposition, opposition from within, our own fallen human nature, the old sin nature, as well as opposition from without, from the world, from our great adversary, the devil himself, as well as even many times well-meaning brethren. Monday night's ABC uh, Monday night uh, football, in between halves, they show the highlights of the games played the previous day. And we would get the impression by watching just those that, that football was mostly these long gainers and these touchdowns. And very seldom do we see the lost yardage, the broken patterns, and the drop passes, and the injuries. And somehow we convey the impression in evangelicalism far too much, that this life of victory in Jesus Christ is just a lot of long gainers and touchdowns. Pete Gilquist in the latest Christianity Today said, some modern evangelicals have taught a bogus notion of victory that has made people unrealistic and passive. Christian victory somehow has been made synonymous not with struggle and pain, but with living the good life the smell of smoke and fire that permeated the robes of the ancients has all but disappeared from our vestments. We have been tamed, and we have redefined tolerance to justify a cessation of hostilities with the powers of evil. There's some real common misconceptions about the Christian life. Some think that uh, if, because you're a Christian, all your problems are solved. Nothing could be further from the truth or that the Bible speaks on every subject explicitly. The Bible does not speak on every problem or su subject explicitly. God wants us to take a step at a time and apply some general principles and let him lead us in those non-specifics. Another misconception is that if we're having problems, we're unspiritual. Another misconception is that being exposed to sound Bible teaching automatically solves our problems. No matter how gifted the teacher, no matter how sound the teaching, this does not solve our problems. As someone has said, there are many people cruising from church to church, from Bible conference to Bible conference, filling notebook after notebook, wearing out Bible after Bible, who are still some of the crankiest, fussiest, most irresponsible people you meet. Why? Because they do not practice the things they hear. And as we begin to practice the things we hear, we not only will know more deeply and intimately this inexhaustible person in the realm of our experience and the power of his resurrection, but we will share in the fellowship of his sufferings. And part of those sufferings that Jesus went through was laying aside his rights, his privileges, his prerogatives not being recognized and responded to for who he was, being misunderstood even, not only misunderstood but not accepted and even rejected. Swindoll writes in his book, Two Steps Forward, Three Steps Forward, Two Steps Backwards, this. This past summer, my wife and I went through one of the most painful times of our lives. Disarmed and defenseless, we got a firsthand bitter taste of that painfully familiar paralyzing sting of humanity. We had done what was right, but we were misinterpreted and therefore maligned. Unfair criticism increased the pain and brought us in tears to our knees. I remembered a statement of C.S. Lewis when he once said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. 
pain is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Believe me, he had our undivided attention, crushed and bruised. All we could do was wait. Although the swelling from the sting was now gone, the memory is not. We shall never forget those anguishing weeks. But now that we have, they have passed, something very beautiful has emerged in our lives. We are much more sensitive to others, much more concerned about putting, our, putting ourselves in the other guy's shoes. Not nearly so concerned about the acceptance or the understanding or even the happiness, the comfort, the satisfaction that the human nature longs out for so much. Our time is up, but this passage goes on. It talks about the fact that he hasn't obtained this that he's striving for yet. He hasn't become perfect. Verse 12, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. His great passion was, and this, what he wants to be laid hold of by Christ Jesus is stated in verse 10. He wants to lay hold of knowing him more deeply and more intimately and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. We love those first two parts, but inseparably we must have the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And he says that I, I press on, verse 12, in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. And the great passion of his life is to lay hold of those specified goals in verse 10. There was once a man who had an extra amount of suffering, loss, disappointment, pain in his life. One night he had a dream that he was with the Lord, looking back on his life, which was portrayed as footprints along the sandy beach. Usually there were two sets of footprints, his and the Savior's. But as he looked closer, he saw only one set of footprints along the very rugged places. He frowned, was confused, and asked the Lord, Look, there, you and I have walked together during much of my lifetime. But when things really got bad, where did you go? I needed you. I needed you the most at those times, and why did you leave? And the answer came back, my child, I have never left you. The two sets of footprints assure you of that. But there were times when it was almost more than you could bear. At those very, very hard times, I carried you in my arms. The single set of footprints you see at those perilous, perilous places are mine. That was when I was carrying you. And Paul again, the great heartbeat is that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Let's stand for the benediction.